Okay, hello everyone. Um, getting towards the end of the day, so I hope you're all still energetic. I know I am, because I've been up for 30 something hours. Just flew in, first time here, it's cool. Okay, um, uh -oh. there's some privacy leaks on this screen, aren't there? Uh huh. A different horizon. Okay, hold on a sec. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. There. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Sorry. Um. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, I have sort of two talks in a row. They are distinct files as such. So you can't just concatenate and hash. I guess you have to make sort of an accumulator to prove that each of the individual talks are occurring. Um, so first I'm going to talk about accumulators. And it's mostly about RSA accumulators. Um, and then because my next talk is about U3XO, which was, is what I've been working on for a while. And I have a paper on ePrint. Uh, and we'll try to submit it to a conference soon um, about U3XO, which is a hash-based accumulator. And I'll try to sort of talk about the differences and advantages and disadvantages of Z2. OK. So intro, I'm Taj Raja. I worked on authored Lightning Network, discrete log contracts, fun stuff. Um, and the last year or so, I've been working on U3XO, which I think is really cool. And hopefully, we'll get into Bitcoin, and everyone will use it, and it'll be great. Um, I guess if you have questions, it seems like people just sort of interrupt, which is cool. Um, if we have too much of it and there's not enough time, come bug me after. OK, so what's this about accumulators? I've heard of these things. Uh, so cryptography has lots of fun tools, uh, not just encryption and signing. And the idea of cryptography to increase the scalability of Bitcoin sounds great. Um, but oops, as with all engineering, lots of trade-offs here. Um, we want to keep track of like billions of things. So right now in Bitcoin, there's, uh, I've, I guess if you've looked through the rest of this day, you sort of know that Bitcoins are split up into UTXOs, the unspent outputs of transactions. And those are what wallets keep track of. Those are what ends up as inputs in the next set of transactions. Um, and so those are sort of the coins. And right now there's about 60 million of them, not too many. Um, and it's sort of an interesting trade-off in that you want more, right? You want more people to use Bitcoin. And if you're using Bitcoin, you have to have your own UTXO. Otherwise, you're just sort of mushed in with a bunch of other people's coins on like Coinbase or something. And that's, that's not the whole point. Um, you want your own wallet, your own node to verify things. You got your own private keys, your own UTXOs. Uh, so you want lots of people to use it, right? You want billions of people to use this. But you don't want it to be too big because everyone has to keep the UTXO set. So, but the desire would be, yeah, it'd be great if we had you know, really good scalability so you could have billions of UTXOs. Um, but also, we wanted to take up like one kilobyte. Sounds crazy, right? But I think it's doable. Um, so you know, also, you can start with what you need. And I think Greg Maxwell said on IRC several times, I want a pony. Um, but we, there are trade-offs, but, but they're not too bad. OK, so hash functions seem to be the, like this, right? You've heard of them, I'm sure. Uh, you have the hash of x, and you call it y. And y looks unrelated to x. Um, and the two main properties that we normally talk about are something's one way or you know, pre-image resistance. Uh, given y, you can't figure out what x was. And you also want it to be collision free so that uh, you can't find sort of two inputs that give you the same output. Um, but one thing we don't talk about as much, well, it's still important, is that sometimes you, you know, call this a digest, message digest. An important property is that x and y are not the same length. Right? The output of a hash function is like 32 bytes, but the input can be huge. Right? So you can have a hash of a gigabyte file, and you still have this 32-byte little hash. And this is really useful. Um, so if you want to prove that something hasn't changed in your file, you don't have to keep track of the file. You, let's say it's a, some big PDF document or some image. And you don't have to store it, but you, you know, take the image. It's a gigabyte or something, and then you just keep the hash of it and throw away the image. And then later, when someone presents you the image, you hash it again to make sure it hasn't been modified. Um, this is super useful, and this is super easy with hash functions. Um, and we want to do that, but for lots of things. So what if we want more flexibility, like a set of n files instead of just one? 
Well, you could just save the hashes of each file, right? Which works okay, but it is O of n space, right? So the number of files you have is, you know, the number of space, the amount of spaces you're, you're going to take up is proportional to the number of files, right? So if you're saying, okay, I've got a bunch of JPEGs, I want to make sure no one's Photoshopping them, they're the real deal. Uh, so I'm just going to save the hash of every JPEG and then delete them all. And then next time I connect to Instagram or Google Photos or whatever, they might be lying. They might be, you know, editing my photos and, and sending them back to me. I don't trust them. So I'm just going to keep all my hashes and then I'm going to compare them. You could do that and that would work. And for something like images, it would probably be fine because you probably don't have millions. You probably may have more like thousands. And, you know, 32 bytes times thousands, it's pretty small. Um, but it is O of n, right? So it, it, in, in big O notation, it actually doesn't get you anywhere. In practice, the, the constants are great, but um, it's O of n. So what we'd really like is O of 1. O of 1 is awesome. O of log n is still pretty good. Um, it'd also be cool if you could like add and remove from these sets later on and maybe prove membership and non-membership as well. So what can do this? Uh, there are constructions that can do this. They're called accumulators. Um, and the basic functions are, you know, generate. You sort of make up some kind of setup parameters of the accumulator. Uh, then you have an add function, which takes the accumulator and adds an element to it and maybe spits out a proof. And then you want to be able to verify. So given an accumulator, an element, and a proof, it returns a yes or no. That yes, this element is in there, or no, it's not. A proof is, it's not well, def like, we haven't defined the implementation, but it's some data that allows you to verify that an element is contained within the accumulator, that has been previously added to the accumulator. Like the 32-bit mask? Uh, it, it could be, if you think of a Merkle path, it's sort of like a proof. Uh, and in RSA accumulators, I'll, I'll show what the proof is in there. Um, but so in, in both cases, I'm going to talk about Merkle, like sort of hash based and also RSA based. They all have these, but they're pretty different how they do these things. Um, so if you just think of a straight up Merkle tree, yeah, you can think of it as a static accumulator. It sort of has these. Uh, the generate and add are kind of smushed together, and you only get one shot with a Merkle tree, right? You say, I've got a thousand elements. I want to put them all into a Merkle tree and take the Merkle root, and then I will also be able to later provide proofs for inclusion. Um, but once I've discarded all the rest of the Merkle tree, all these elements, I can't add things to it. So if you have the, you know, the block header in Bitcoin that's 80 bytes long and you've got that Merkle tree, uh, Merkle root, you can't say, oh, I want to take this Merkle root and add another transaction on at the end. There's no operation to do that. Uh, well, I will talk about If, uh, it, okay, so if you knew, well, so we're getting there, uh, and this, this will be part of what, well, that happens later, but um, yes, if you know, one, you know how many elements are in the Merkle tree, uh, and, well, and then you add, uh, it's, it gets messy, right? So like, also, because Merkle trees, a lot of times, in Bitcoin anyway, they sort of pad it out with like zeros, I think. Or does it hash? No, it hashes the same thing on the left and right when there's nothing on the, uh, on the side to hash. The yeah, it doubles the last one and then goes up that way. So there are ways, I, I will get to that in the next half hour part. Uh, but yes, there are ways to extend Merkle trees to do a lot more. And that's what most of the research in U3XO is. Um, but the RSA ones are sort of the more classically studied, I don't know, classically, it's not that long in the last 15 years, I guess. Um, but there's a bit more research on RSA ones because they do seem more promising, I guess. I, I don't, I should state my biases. I like the hash based ones. That's what I've been working on for a year. So I'm going to be a proponent of those. Um, there are other people that are working on RSA style ones uh, that I think are cool research. I don't think they're as practical. And so that's why I'm working on the hash based ones. Um, so I'm going to talk about the RSA based stuff for the next 20 minutes. Um, and I think it's cool, and I think it's great research, 
but I'm of the opinion that it's not actually going to be that applicable, and I'll show why. Um, okay, so <laughs> the yeah Merkle tree alone, you get the idea. It's it's like an accumulator, but you sort of only have this one shot, so we call it static. Um, another other terms are like dynamic, which also lets you remove and incrementally add, which is good, uh, and universal. If, if an accumulator is universal, there's also a prove and verify for non-inclusion. So you'll be able to say, hey, this, this element is not in the set. Um, there may be uses for that in Bitcoin. Um, I think there's like fraud proofs, things like that, like ideas where, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could prove that this UTXO didn't exist or had already been spent? So different ideas. OK, so uh, RSA-based accumulators. Wait, RSA? That's, if, if people don't know what RSA is, I will try to give a real quick intro slash refresher. Um, RSA is, is old. It's one of the original public key uh, algorithms in cryptography. Um, it is not used in Bitcoin. It's too big, I guess, too slow. I don't know. Elliptic curve signatures and stuff seem kind of newer and cooler, I guess. Um, but RSA does have some properties that elliptic curve stuff does not. Um, Okay, also RSA is like a total minefield. I'm explaining stuff like super high level, and I will mention the things that will like destroy the, sa the security of this. Um, so the basic idea of RSA is you're multiplying two big prime numbers together, and you tell everyone the product, but you keep the factorization. Um, and Intuitively, I mean, even like kids in school, I think I learned about it when I was a little kid. I didn't know how it really worked, but it's like, yeah, if you multiply two big prime numbers and give the result, it's hard to figure out what those two original numbers were, right? So the public key is you come up with two prime numbers, P and Q, and you multiply them together to get N, which is P times Q. And N is essentially the public key. And your private key is Euler's totient, which is you take the, which is basically the easy way to do it if you know the factorization is p minus 1 times q minus 1. And this, I'm not explaining how you do it, but this lets you compute a sort of inverse of, of an exponent. So e is the public exponent, uh, which can be 3, although I think it's safer to be like 65537, uh, which is just sort of a standard number they use as an exponent. And then m is some message you're trying to send like sign or encrypt or whatever. Um, and then D is your decryption exponent, uh, which is computed given phi and D, or phi and E. So the, the property you have for this is that M to the E to the D is equal to M to the, wait, sorry, M to the E to the D is equal to M to the D to the E, uh, which is equal to M again, mod N, right? So if you raise m to e, like qubit or 65537 it, and then raise it that product, that uh, result again to d, you end up back where you started. Um, and this is really cool because then you can do things like encryption and decryption and signing and verifying, which are like the same thing and it's really cool. So if you want to encrypt a message to someone, uh, you take your message m and raise it to the third power modulo that public key. And when the person wants to decrypt it, they take your, uh, your ciphertext, C, raise that to D, and they'll get M. Uh, similarly, signing and verifying, this, the procedure for signing something is the exact same as decrypting. Just raise, raise the message to the private exponent. And verifying is then the same as encrypting. You raise it to the public exponent, modulo uh, the public N modulus. Cool. OK, so that's. RSA as it's classically known. Some of the pitfalls, uh, if either P or Q are, sorry, if either P minus one or Q minus one is smooth, which means it has a bunch of small factors, then you can break the security of this. If, there's, there's all sorts of things where like things go horribly wrong in RSA. Uh, so if you just implement textbook RSA, it, it won't be secure. Um, there are ways to make it secure, but it's a lot of sort of tacked on extra things. Um, also, it's a little tricky because your private key is like this group of primes, uh, so you can't just like have your own random number for a prime for a pub private key the way you can in elliptic curve stuff like in Bitcoin. Um, there's no there's no direct way to say oh my I have a hash and that's my private key. Okay, so 
how would you use this to make accumulators? Uh, so it's the same basic operations, uh, but we don't, have, we don't have m as this arbitrary sort of hash-like message. m starts as, you can think of m, you can think of the base in this case as something more like e in the previous case. So you can start with like, we'll call it v, and it starts with like 3 or maybe 65537, just some base that then will exponentiate enough that it way overflows the modulus and wraps around enough to make it all, uh, you know, you can't go backwards anymore. So the idea is you still have n equals p times q. Uh, there's no d and e anymore. Start with v, let's say 3, and then for every element in the set x, you exponentiate with that element, but the exponents have to be prime. So you need to be able to hash onto primes, which is also a somewhat costly operation, right? So if the only thing this accumulator can contain is primes, we're going to say, OK, I've got my UTXO, or I've got my JPEG, I've got my data, and I need a hash function that is basically a hash function, right? I throw whatever data in, something random looking comes out, but only prime numbers come out. Um, and this is doable, but there's different ways to do it. There's like random oracle model way where you say, OK, I'm going to have a hash output, and then I'm going to like extend it and like check if it's prime. And if it's not prime, I'm going to tweak it and hash again and keep doing that until I find a prime number. And uh, you'll, you'll find one eventually, uh, but, it, but it takes longer. And then there's other more fancy math ways to do it that are uh, in theory faster, but actually in practice slower. But anyway. So that's, that's one downside, but you got to do that. Um, but then the way to, to add elements to this, this accumulated set is you raise to the power of that element. So if you've got your initial um, accumulator, sort of empty accumulator v, which is just like 3, then you say, OK, I'm going to take 3 to the x mod n. And x is your element that you're adding to the set that's been hashed onto a prime. And you keep doing that for x1, x2, x3. Uh, you exponentiate, and now you've got your new accumulator value. And then you raise it to the next power, and you've got your new accumulator value. Um, so you can keep doing that basically as many times as you want, a billion times, sure. It's going to be slow, but you can do it. Um, and then the proof, so an inclusion proof, P, is also an accumulator, V, but with every element except the element you want to prove in it. So if you want to, let's say I just, for Simplicity, do the three. I've got x1, x2, and x3. And the way I've computed my, my accumulator v is I took v, which initially was just the number three, uh, raised to x1 mod n, then raise, it to x, raise that result to x2 mod n, then raise that result to x3 mod n, and everyone's got that new accumulator value v. If I want to prove to someone that x2 is in it, I give them v to the x1 to the x3 mod n. And then I give them x2. And then I you know, give them both. And they say, OK, well, is p to the x, the element that's being verified, equal to the value that I've already got as my accumulator? And if it is equal, um, then we're good. And this is secure under the strong RSA assumption. Yeah, they call it quasi-commutative in the literature because the initial v part has its own like starting point. But yeah, it's it's commutative, so you, the order doesn't matter, right? You should get the same result whether you do x1, x2, x3, or x3, x1, x2, or whatever. Um, so which do you need to update your own proof all the time, or can other people update everybody else's proof? Well, if everything's public, everyone can do everything. Um, but yes, the proofs change when more elements are added to the accumulator, right? So if you've got a proof, so if there's three elements and you say, hey, I've got a proof for x2, which is just v to the x1 to the x3, uh, and then x4 comes along, well, now that proof, you just also exponentiate with x4. Uh, yes? When do you perform the mod n? The after. Uh, wait, did I forget it about n some? Wait. Oh, I didn't yeah, you basically do it. So mathematically, you can just omit it if you want. You're like, I'm just going to raise it three times, but but don't because it gets huge. So basically, you you do the mod n after every step. Um, so you need to do it after p to the power of x. Also, in the last 
I wouldn't say need. You, you, it's way faster to do that, yes. You don't mathematically need to, but you should, because it's way faster. In fact, you, you actually you do modular exponentiation. So like, you're sort of mixing the exponentiation and the, and the modulo part together to make it faster. Um, if, you just, if you sort of directly, you could in software. It'll still work, but it'll be slower. You could say, no, I'm actually doing whatever my v is to the whatever. And then afterward, I'm going to get this huge thing, which is, no, it's going to be too big to store on a computer, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, you have to do modular exponentiation. Yeah. <laughs> This line. Yeah. I guess why you're. Why don't you do uh, the mode n after this? And, and only do it yeah. Sorry. No. It is. It's it, like. Sorry. The whole thing. Like. P to the x mod n equal to v mod n. Like. Well, v has already been mod n. I guess. So yeah. Like. This p to the x start is a, is a modular exponentiation, and so it's it's all. I think I, I at some point in the slides I I stopped writing mod n. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, I have it here. I'm like, should I? Like, everything's mod n. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just because I think in practice, you can't actually do this without mushing the, mod the modulo part into the exponentiation. It gets too big. Um, yeah. You, you, you spoke about exclusion proof. Uh, I wonder how this will work out. There is, I did, I, yeah, I didn't put the slides in. There is a way. It's kind of complicated, and I didn't 100% understand it. it also, like I was reading a couple papers because I wanted to put a slide in about it, but <laughs> um, you might need to know P and Q to make the exclusion proofs. But then I think there's recent papers that say there's a way to do it without it that's pretty complex. Um, if you know P and Q, <sighs> I, I, I'd have to look at the paper again. But there is a way to... to Right, right. You you get like sort of the the inverse of the, of the x, which is which involves like phi, which is p minus one times q minus one. Um, anyway, so there's a way to do it, but I'm not sure if it's practical for the use case here, which would be where like hopefully no one knows um, p and q. But uh, there's there's a bunch of there's there's different papers about how to do that. Also, I'm not sure it's that useful to have exclusion proofs in this case uh, for Bitcoin. But anyway, okay. So so. This is cool. The good parts of this are everything's constant size, right? So V, the accumulator itself, P, the proof, which sort of looks like an accumulator, just minus one element, uh, X, the elements themselves. Everything's sort of the same size as N, the modulus, right? Once you're in RSA world, like everything is the same size. That's cool. Um, you can also prove many inclusions at once if you wanted to. Again, the same size. So if you had like a a whole block of transactions you wanted to prove were, or your whole wallet full of transact or UTXOs you wanted to prove. Uh, and a, a, an inclusion proof of many elements is just the accumulator with all of those elements removed. And then when they want to verify it, they just have a whole bunch of X's that they exponentiate to make their sort of accumulator with only these elements and then compare it to taking the proof exponentiated with that. So, so that's kind of cool. Like you can prove a thousand things and the proof size is, is the same size. So that's really nice. So there's a lot of cool things. And then there's uh, more recent work by uh, Bonet and Benedict and someone else on the paper, I forget, that uh, they have like really efficient ways to do these things and all sorts of cool like vector commitments. So you get order preserving, all these cool things. But there's downsides. The big one is P and Q are trusted setup, right? So who's making up these P and Q random numbers? Uh, if you know P and Q, you can create false proofs, right? You can prove anything because uh, you know the order. Um, and while proofs are aggregatable, proof updates are not. So that's what I want to show. So if you want to update the proofs, which I, we just mentioned, someone pointed out, um, let's say I've got a set with big X. And there's like, I think I said, let's say seven little x's in it. There's x1, x2, up to x7. And then I've got my proofs. So proof one is v to the set x without x1 in it. The notation's a little weird here. But p2 is then v to the big x without x2 in it. p3 is v to the x without x3 in it, and so on. Right? Those are the proofs. Now I want to add element x8. Um, so I've got all these, I've got these seven proofs, and now I actually have to modify all of them individually, right? I'm going to take P1 and 
raise it to x8, p2 to x8, p3 to x8. There's no nice way to sort of make this into one operation, right? Because p1, p2, and p3, they're completely different numbers. Um, there's no good way to do one opcode and get them all to happen at the same time, right? Um, this it includes adding multiple elements to each proof, right? So if I want to, oh, cool. Um, if, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, if I want to add x8 and x9 to the set, and I want to keep all my proofs, well, now I have to take p1 to the x8 to the x9, p2 to the x8 to the x9. And that's two modular exponentiations for each thing. So it's, it's, you, can, you can see how this gets sort of O of n squared-ish looking, where, wait, I've got all these proofs, and I've got all these, these um, extra elements I'm adding in. And if I'm maintaining a proof for everything, it can get expensive. Um, and that so maybe there's a way to fix this. It feels like inherent because it's a group of unknown order, but I don't know. OK, so how bad is this, right? What if we want to accumulate some bitcoins, which sort of has a double entendre? Um, if there's only a few updates to the proofs and they're infrequent, then we're OK. But if we're looking at the UTXO set, which we probably want to use this for, well, proof updates happen every 10 minutes, right? Every time a block comes in, your UTXO set changes. Um, so if you wanted, I'll, I'll get to why you might want this later. Um, but if you wanted, in the best case, to say, OK, we've got 60 million UTXOs. That's what we have right now. And let's say there's around 6,000 updates every 10 minutes, 600 seconds. I sort of made up the 6,000 because you get a nice 10 per second. But uh, it's somewhere around there. So if you had individual proofs, if you wanted to maintain an individual proof for every UTXO, so you got 60 million of them, they're each going to be like what? RSA numbers like a couple hundred bytes, less than a kilobyte, right? You're going to have like 2K RSA, 4K RSA or something. So 4,000 bits, eh, 500 bytes, something like that. Um, so it's not actually that big, right? You can fit it on a hard drive. The problem is the CPU. So you're going to have 600 million modular exponentiations per second. That's too much, right? So, um, on, well, this laptop's really slow. But even on a good CPU, one millisecond is really pushing it. I don't think you can do a one millisecond RSA operation. Um, so even if, it, even if you can do one RSA operation in one millisecond, you're going to need 600,000 CPU cores to keep up. Uh, that's, those, you know, it's it like, in a like cryptography theoretical sense, it's practical because like you can buy 600,000 CPU cores, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's too much. Um, what if we had a different model? Said, look, why do you need a proof for everything? What if people sort of only keep their own proofs? Like your wallet keeps a proof for your own coins, right? Maybe maybe that's more tractable, more reasonable. Okay, so let's say you have a lightly used wallet. You're not an exchange. You're not anything. You're just a little wallet. You have a couple bitcoins or a couple Satoshis, whatever. A couple Bitcoins got a lot now. Um, you have 10 UTXOs. And so that's, again, the 6,000 updates per block times 10 TXOs. So you're going to have 60,000 uh, exponentiations per block, even at one millisecond, which is a screaming fast uh, operation. That's a minute of CPU time right, for one core per block. Doable, but that's a big ask. right? You're like, hey. Your IBD is now, ugh, like, you're adding an enormous amount of CPU load. It's doable, right? If, once you're synced up, you can keep up, right? Every 10 minutes, your, your proofs are now going to be modified when a block comes in. And it's going to take, and you can parallelize that. You can parallelize this easily, right? So the fact that there's all these different proofs, you can, you can independently do those operations. So if you have a quad core, yeah, your, your CPU spins up for 20 seconds or whatever when a block comes in. Not the end of the world, but, but still kind of not great. And if you have a lot of UTXOs, it's, it's, a, it's a big ask. So I'm just saying, why yeah. do you need to make a proof so every time the block comes in? Can I just the proofs change. So if you, want, proof if you want to maintain a proof, yeah, yeah. right, so that it changes. So, so you could just wait until all the blocks are downloaded and make the proof? You're still going to have to do all the work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess you have sort of cut through in that if a, if a UTXO was added and then later removed, you could say, oh, well, I don't, I don't need to, I can sort of cut through. So yeah, I guess it's not that bad, but yeah. yeah but maybe I didn't understand something, but you don't need to do an exponential for each of these. You can multiply the exponents one time and then do an exponential. I don't, 
think that's the case if you don't know the factorization of the modulus. Is if you have, for example, a to the power of b, that's the power of c, the power of d, like a to the power of b, that's the power of c, in any ring. You don't need to know anything. You don't, you don't, need, the you order, don't, you don't need the order of the group. So you, you don't need the order of the group. Right. But can you? You do need it. Like sorry, you do, sorry. You, do you, you can't. I don't think you can just. Can you just multiply? No, I don't think you can just order. multiply them. If if you know the order, you're right, right. You if you have the private key, you can. You can say you cannot multiply the the exponents together, but first and then do it. You have to do it one by one. You don't know the order. Right, because the modulo step. Ah. Would you? Okay, I'm. I'm not an expert. I I believe one of the papers. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I. There, there's. Okay, here's in the paper where, well, here's a paper. There's a bunch of papers. I'm not an expert on the RSA part. Yeah. I think there, this, this paper anyway, I don't know, says uh, computing is only public key, therefore requires computing G products of all the RAs, mod N, as G, like sequentially, mod N doing modulation. So I, I, I can send you the link, or we can do after, but I should move on. But I, I'm, I'm not saying like I personally believe this, but like I read it in the paper, so. That's sort of a cop out, but anyway. <laughs> but, but. Oh. Right. Um, yeah, there's a way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I didn't put that. Sorry. Yes, there there is a way with knowledge of only the pub key uh, to calculate that. But anyway. Um, but. So the big issue, I think, is, is there's, one, there's the trusted setup, and two, there's the seemingly intractable way of, of you know, aggregating all these things. Um, so there's some solutions to these things. So one is um, we have this trusted setup, but maybe we can get rid of this trusted setup. And this is going even further into things I cannot explain. Um, class groups of binary quadratic forms. If, and it was hard to find a paper about this. I guess Chia, which is um, Bram Cohen's working on this coin called Chia, and they're really into class groups. So they have a paper that's called Binary Quadratic Form. If you look like Chia class groups, there you can find a PDF, and it's, it's intense. Uh, a lot of LaTeX in that, and I don't really know how it works. I mean, like it, it's, it starts out OK. The first couple pages are like, yeah, plus or minus 4AC. I remember that. And b squared, you know, like it's got all this like quadratic formula stuff, and you're like, okay, and then it, it just gets harder and harder. Anyway, so so this may be able to create a group of unknown order where you can do all these cool RSA operations uh, without a trusted setup, and I think that's another promising thing. So I'm not saying this doesn't work. I'm saying there's ways to make it work and make it practical, um, but it's still it's still a bit researchy, I think. Okay, so what about those Merkle trees? Uh, we had hash-based tree-like accumulators. Um, there's previous research about this, but uh, many of them have this sort of manager or one entity that is not necessarily trusted, but keeps a list of all the elements that have already been accumulated. And I will talk about how you a uh, novel hash-based dynamic accumulator, which is really optimized for Bitcoin and U3XO. OK, so that I don't really know why I'm doing this. But anyway, switch tabs. Um, oops. Okay, so any general questions, comments, accumulators? Cool. Okay, so now I will talk about. Oh, yeah. um, I think I've asked this before. I forgot the answer. But what? What about ETB accumulators? Are there any? Or oh, there's like a bilinear. There's like a sort of. Because you got your prime field. I don't know if that helps. Well, you need so there. There is a construction with 
um, what's on? Uh, what do you call it? Bilinear pairing kind of like like pairing curves that I've read about but didn't read enough about. Um, but I don't think with regular like SecP you can do one. There's that like mu, mu hash or set like Sipa was talking about like a s sort of incremental or a, a set hash thing, but but you can't make proofs. I don't know. So I, I, I don't think there's anything where you can just take regular old SecP and make an accumulator out of it. Um, I think there are ways with pairing curves to do it. Um, but that's another whole area that I haven't looked at as much. Um, OK, so I'll talk about uh, UTXO, which the goal anyway is full nodes in kilobytes. OK, so I'm sure people, everyone here runs a full node, right? Yay. Um, if you go into your full node folder dot Bitcoin, which just as an aside, why do all the really important folders start with a period so you can't see them when you say ls? Because like my Bitcoin folder is way more important than everything else. I guess, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so if you go in there and you say du dash h, it says, I think this, I, I updated this today, it's around 253 for blocks and three and a half for chain state. Um, so, oh, sorry? Oh, okay. um, so 253 is the history, right? That's the blockchain. That's from 2009 up to today, all the blocks and, and some undo data and a little extra stuff, but basically the blocks. Uh, and then the current state, the UTXO set, is this three and a half gigs. Um, so the, the history only goes up, right? Unless, I guess you could have like a huge reorg that had empty blocks and the history could go down. But I think you still save them in the database even if that happens. Anyway, um, and the UTXO set can decrease in size. Um, so UTXOs, they're pretty small. They're like, I don't know, 64 bytes. You have your PK script, your amount, the out point. Uh, they're not, they're, yeah, they're tiny. Uh, but there's lots of them. There's about 60 million. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, no. You, anyway, this line is 60 million. It goes up and down. 90. What? More like 90. No, so, so if you look on like blockchain.info, they'll say you have like 90 million or something. Um, I guess in their definition you do. Uh, but according to Bitcoin Core, there's about 60 million. So uh, some sites count op returns as UTXOs, which by the literal definition of an unspent transaction output, yeah, an op return is an unspent transaction output. Um, but, but, what's sorry? It's unspendable, right? So, the, so in Bitcoin Core, you have like this is unspendable check. And if it's an op return, well, we just never put it in the database to start with. Um, so that so you will see different numbers for this on different sites. I'm going with the the Bitcoin Core's sort of definition because yeah, if it's op return, you don't have to worry about it, which is good. And so like op return, you should encourage people to use op return so you don't sort of pollute the UTXO set. Uh, did you? Have? Does it include dust? Like dust I believe it includes dust. Um, it does not. What is the expendable? It's if you're like pub key script is greater than 10 kilobytes, it doesn't include it, because that, that's considered unspendable. But like zero Satoshi, but has a regular pub key script, uh, still goes into the UTXO set, and is spendable. I think it's non-standard, but yeah. So, and there's a lot of it. There, like I, when I was doing this research and playing around, there's so many weird things in the UTXO set. There's like all these op returns that are just op return and then no data afterwards, and it's like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> and there's all sorts of like, unspendable, that are obviously unspendable to me, like looking at it, but we don't have a, you know, algorithm in the code to, to recognize it as unspendable and, and refuse to put it in the database. But anyway, um, so you got about 60 million in the current core database. I guess it wouldn't be a forking change to update the, the is spendable code if you did it right. So anyway, so 60 million, it mostly goes up. Sometimes it goes down. Like this is probably consolidation from exchanges after the big price run up uh, almost two years ago. Who knows? Uh, but the general trend is up. And, and you sort of want it to go up because you want more people to use this, right? Um, so wouldn't it be cool if we could just smoosh it all with an accumulator? Well, I already said this, right? Um, well, what's the problem? Where I mentioned before with the RSA one, what if wallets just kept track of their own accumulators or of their own, their own proofs? So everyone, instead of having their UTXO 3.5 gig database, they just had their accumulator value. So every time a block came in, they would remove all the things that got spent and add all the things that got added in. 
And the way they remove is they've got these proofs from other people. So that when you now send a transaction and you've got two or three inputs, you say, hey, here's my inclusion proof for my three inputs in my transaction. And then everyone verifies that against their current accumulator and says, yep, those are in there. And now I'm going to uh, accept this transaction and take them out. Um, so this should be maintainable in the RSA model. The problem is how do you transition to that? So if you're the first person to say, hey, I'm using this cool new accumulator-based uh, Bitcoin node. I've got proofs for all my UTXOs in my wallet, and I'll give them to anyone and show that my transactions are valid. The problem is no one's going to give me a proof for anything. right? I'm the first person using this, so no one has any idea what I'm doing. Everyone's running Bitcoin Core 0.18 point whatever, and they don't know about this stuff, so I'm stuck. I can't validate transactions if I throw away my UTXO set and only have this little accumulator value, because I'm dependent on everyone else. I'm, the, the hope is everyone's wallet keeps, accumulate, uh, keeps proofs, and since no one's does, I can't validate. So it seems like a hard bootstrapping problem. Like how are you, it's, it's maybe, it's not even, I guess it's sort of a soft fork if you committed to the proofs, but you have to sort of, everyone at once says, okay, now everyone's going to switch to always having these proofs along with your transactions. And that's a hard thing to do in Bitcoin. Um, so you need a bridge node. And I didn't come up, this, this was sort of what led me into this research was a year and a half ago talking to Peter Wool, I think at Financial Crypto, and he was, say, he was looking at different accumulators with like lattices and RSA and all these things, and he's like, the problem is the bridge node. You know, whatever setup you're going to try to do to get it to, you know, get off the ground, you're going to need a node that has a proof for everything and keeps those proofs up to date. And that, in all these constructions, is, is just not feasible, right? You need data centers worth or something. Um, but it is feasible with the hash-based ones, so that's the cool part, right? So bridge nodes need, they maintain a proof for every UTXO, and they sort of bridge the old network, which doesn't, which just has regular uh, transactions, and the new network that's got everyone with this accumulator and say, yeah, I threw out my UTXO set, I need proofs. Um, so this is problematic for RSA. You can't really run a bridge node on a reasonable computer. Um, okay, yeah, so Merkle trees. Uh, let's make a hash-based accumulator for UTXOs. And a bridge node would just store the whole Merkle tree. And updates to the tree are sort of inherently aggregated. When you remove something from a tree and recompute the root, you've recomputed all the proofs, right? Um, however, we're going to need to use a bunch of trees. Uh, so the accumulator itself is going to be log n instead of o of 1, which a bit disappointing, but we'll, we'll live. Um, OK, so first I'll walk through how to make a Merkle tree. And I think it's kind of fun because people are like, wait, I think I know how to do this. Um, a Merkle tree where you can add leaves. And this was not novel for me. This was in a paper from people I talked to at uh, BU, Sophia Nakubov. I don't know. She, she helped. She had a paper. I actually talked to her about it. Really, really helped out. Um, OK, so let's say you have a Merkle tree, and you got four leaves in it. And you only keep the root, right? So the only thing you know is this orange thing on the top. Uh, you've forgotten all the things below it. So now you add a leaf. You say, OK, all I know is the top. I want to add a new element. Uh, now there's five elements. And what you do is you just keep both. So now you have a root with four underneath and a root with just itself one underneath. And now if you added another, you get six elements. Um, now you've got one with four underneath, and you've got two that are sort of on their own. And you can combine the two into another tree with two underneath this root. And then as you add a seventh element, this stands on its own. And as you add to eight elements, you're like, oh, I can combine these two. And I can combine those two. And now I can combine those two. And now I've got a single root for all eight elements. The fun thing is the number of roots is the number of one bits in the number of leaves. Right? So when you have four, that's 100 zero, zero in binary. When you have five, that's 101. Six is 110. Seven is 111. And then eight is 1000. So it's kind of cool. If you know how many leaves you have, you know how many tr trees you need. Um, similar, but the mountain range didn't it have like um, 
different lengths where, where you'd have different uh, length paths to the bottom from the top. So I think in this one, it's not quite the same. Um, so this is, this is off of work from a different paper. But yeah, they're, they're similar ideas where you're sort of adding things together. But in this case, the trees are always perfect, right? So all the trees are always powers of two. Um, and there's always, you know, same descent. Um, yes, so if you have a proof for, say, if one of your proofs is in here, and then, you know, if, one, if you're proving element, uh, let's say element zero, the leftmost element on the bottom, uh, for all of this activity, you don't have to change anything, right? New trees get added and your proof's the same. But when, the, when this happens, now your proof, which used to be this and this, now gets this. So your proof gets bigger. So yes, yeah, so the proofs still do need to be added. Um, but you sort of get the proof updates for free, in that if you are maintaining an accumulator root, when you perform the hashing operations to compute the new root, your, the intermediate hashes, are you can just save them instead of discarding them, and those goes into your proof. How would you remove that element? That's... Uh, deleting, yes. So removing, and I, th I think this is novel. I'm still waiting. The paper's been on ePrint for a couple months, and no one's been like, dude, this was in this other paper 10 years ago. So I think it's novel, but we'll see. Hopefully no one shows me that I am reinventing something. Um, okay, so here's how you delete things. First example, I've got these three trees. I want to delete element two. Okay, well, the proof for two is three and eight, right? So, 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 oh, so I should say, when you want to delete something, you need the pr inclusion proof for that thing, um, which in Bitcoin is like matches perfectly. The only time you want to delete a UTXO is when it just got spent, and the only time you want to prove that a UTXO exists is when you're spending it. So it's like, cool, you can sort of smush them into a prove and delete like combined operation. Um, and you need the same data for both, which is great. So it lines up great for our use case. Um, so someone's saying, hey, I'm spending UTXO2. The proof for 2 is 3 and 8, right? So I can hash 2 and 3 to get 9, hash 9 and 8 to get 12, verify that 12 is equal to the root I'm storing. OK, now how do I delete it? I need to rearrange things. So in this case, 6 exists, right? We have a root on the sort of first floor, or zeroth floor. So we just move 6 to where 2 was. Uh, we knew what 6 was. And we move 6 to the space that 2 occupied. And now we can recompute 9 because we know 3. We were given 3 as the proof for 2. And we can recompute 12 because we also know 8. And we can discard everything under there. So now we've sort of moved what was at 6 to where the thing that was at 2 got deleted. Um, easy, right? And a lot of updates. Oh, sorry? OK, so wait, I'll, I'll, I'll incrementally. OK, so then another case. So the, it's in the paper. Like the algorithm, the algorithm for one at a time is actually simple. The algorithm for lots at a time is a, a bit more complex. Um, so example two. So let's say we've only got four leaves, right? We've got zero through three down there. And you want to delete element two. In this case, there's no root element down here on the first floor. So what happens? Three and eight are still our proofs. What we do is we just say, OK, 3 is now a root. We delete 9. 8 is now a root. Right? Our, our new roots are the proof that we were just given. Um, these are sort of extreme examples where, in this case, at the first level on the bottom, you had a root. And so you just immediately move it in and then just rehash up to the top. And then in this case, um, there are no floors where something moves in, right? Everything, the entirety of the next accumulator state is the proof, where I've completely broken the tree up. Um, there can be mixtures of these things. But the basic intuition is, um, at, every, at every height, if a root exists and I've got a gap, move the root in. If a root does not exist and I've got a gap, move its sibling and promote that to the next root. Um, and then delete the parent, and then you know go recur, you know not recursively, but go up, go up from bottom to top that way. Um, so and then you can do a little bit fancier. Let's say I want to delete three things at once. Um, so what I can do is 
if I've got any pairs of deletions, I can just ignore them and delete the parent. Um, I can also sort of swap things around, but, but that's, that really saves a lot of time because a lot of times you get clusters where all these things got added at the same time and then they all get deleted at the same time. So, two and, so in this example, uh, two and three, I just say, okay, sorry. So the proof for two, three, deleting two, three, and four is going to be just five and eight, which is kind of nice, right? Because two and three sort of prove each other and you just have eight and the proof for four is five. Okay, so now what do I do? Two and three are twins, so we're good. And now there's nothing to swap. Wait, and then we, yeah, six moves to four. Okay, so now we have a new 10. And we delete nine and go up to there. So now we know 10. Or wait, we only have one deletion. Oh, so we move 10 to where nine is. Right, and we just, re we just computed what 10 was. So we move there. We're gone. We're good. We got a new 12. Okay, so this is maybe not super convincing because it's just sort of diagrams on a screen, but there is software and there's a paper and, and the algorithm seems to work. Um, so that's cool. And it, I do think it's novel, so I don't know. That's fun. The downside is it does swap things around. Oh, I, why is that a downside? Um, it's a downside because what, what you really do to make the proof smaller is you build all the new UTXOs in these little trees. And all the old UTXOs you want in the big trees on the other side. Because you've got really great locality um, with UTXO spending. Wait, I don't if, it's I, a, if I delete a group, or personally I delete one of the elements and then the other two elements, you're always going to get the same result? Yeah, so, so there's a lot of freedom in that you sometimes have a lot of choices. So like in this case, I can, I can swap things around. Like, and and I have, I've tried different ways in the code to see which, they don't make a ton of difference. But like if I'm putting 6 here, well, I know 5 and 6. Maybe I should swap them so that 5's here and 6 is here, so that they like stay more in order. I can do that, right? Like there's, there's a lot of leeway in terms of what algorithm. So you just have to make sure that everyone's running the exact same deterministic algorithm. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, there's a lot of tweaks. It's like, well, what if I do this? What if I you know, remove everything one by one and then add? Like you can get a lot of different ways to do it. Um, but as long as you sort of, we all agree on like, hey, here's the official, you know, sanctioned by whoever <laughs> you tree XO spec, and this is what we're going to do, then everyone's proofs will be compatible. Um, and, and yeah, it needs to be deterministic. You can't have any sort of randomness in there. Um, OK, I, I, I'm running out of time, right? What is, when am I supposed to stop? <laughs> what, what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Soon? OK. Um, so then the idea is, you, yeah, locality. OK. Well. I have locality. Well, I have two slides and then locality. Okay. So the general idea is you'd have this sort of topology where full nodes, regular Bitcoin 0.18, and they talk to a bridge node. And a bridge node looks like a full node to the full nodes, and it looks like a little mini U3XO node to the other mini U3XO nodes. And what it does is when it gets a transaction here, it sticks proofs on and sends it over. And sticking proofs on is easy because it has the whole tree, which currently is, is big. It's like 10 gigs, but like Eh, it's 10 gigs, it takes a few sec, not even a few seconds, less than a second to update when a block comes in because it's just a couple thousand hash operations, not that big of a deal. Um, so like it's a little annoying, but it's like totally runnable on a decent laptop. And so I think people would run them. Uh, and you don't need too many of them. You want redundancy, but like one bridge node can easily handle the, the rate of transactions in the Bitcoin network, right? There's a couple transactions a second. It can, you know, maybe 20, 30 at most uh, proofs added per second, totally doable. Um, maybe you want to run on an SSD, but whatever. Um, is this, uh, this, so these mini nodes, let's say they already updated to the latest state. Yes. They still need the bridge node from then on? Or is it like yeah, they still need it because some random wallet is just going to put a transaction in the mempool, and they're like, is this transaction, like, is this input that it's spending, does it exist? <laughs> right? They, the mini nodes did add that trans. They added that UTXO to their accumulator days ago, but they forgot about it. So now they need a proof again. Um, and they can't provide it themselves. You mean like when it gets spent? It yeah, when it gets spent. So when, when a block comes out and all these, new UTX, all these new outputs get created, they add them to their accumulator. 
and then days later, those outputs get spent, and they forgot about them, so they need a proof. Uh, but the bridge node provides a proof. What are the assumptions about the bridge node? So the bridge node you are relying on for availability. Uh, the bridge node can't lie to you, right? Because if the accumulator construction is correct and you know collision-free, blah blah blah, uh, then they can try to provide a false proof, but you'll immediately be like, the hashes don't line up. Uh, but if they disappear, you'll be stuck because you're like, hey, here's this transaction. I don't know, is it valid or not? Because no one's provided proofs for me. Yeah, yeah. You you can think of this as like ultra pruned, where I I didn't just prune out the history. I pruned out my UTXO set, and now you need to give me proofs for that. Okay, so how bad is the proof size? So so one of the things the accumulator is is log n, the proofs are also log n, right? Because the the trees get big and then the proofs get big. That's bad. Um, we like O of one, not log n. Uh, so one proof, worst case, is like twenty hashes which is with 5,000 inputs in a block, that's like 3.2 megabytes. So this is a 4x retroactive block size increase. Because all the old blocks from five years ago now get bigger, because they've got these proofs on them. Uh, so this is bad. And we need ways to reduce this. And so most of the work with this is like all these optimizations. Because it's not end of the world if you like 3 or 4x the size on the network and on the disk. But it's bad, right? People are not going to be enthusiastic about that. So you want it, you want it to be better. So one of the good ways to optimize. This is like my, my favorite uh, plot from this research. Uh, this is a plot of the lifespan of UTXOs. Uh, histogram. Yeah, this is a histogram, right? There's two charts. Anyway, yeah, so the idea is how many, and I, I, can't, I can't put zero, so it starts at one because it's log scale. Uh, if zero was there, it would be even higher. But the most common lifespan of UTXO is zero blocks where it is created and then consumed in the same block. Which is great, because it never touches the UTXO accumulator, because it only exists within the, a, a block itself. Um, and then the next most common lifetime is one. right? So there's something like 70, 80 million UTXOs that are created in block n and then spent in block n plus one. Um, and then it goes down in sort of a power law from there. The fun part is these bumps. So there's a bump here a bump there and a bump there that are very distinct. This one is six, because everyone knows Satoshi said that six blocks is how long you wait before you immediately spend your new coins. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's not that people are accepting payment after six blocks and like sending the shoes they're selling. It's that, yeah, they've got program. Yeah, you've got a script. So as soon as you have six confirmations, spend it. It's like, why not just spend it right away? I don't know. Anyway. Um, then this one makes sense because it's 100, and miners have to wait 100 blocks, right? So, you, so they're all waiting to spend their, block, their mining reward, and that's the bump there. This one's 433 and 434, which I guess is like three days. So I don't know, but there's a distinct people wait exactly three days and then move their coins. I, yeah, who knows? Uh, oh, yeah, and then 1,000 has a big bump, too. So anyway, like these are just sort of fun. They don't, they don't really matter, but, but the clear trend is that a lot of activity is happening where UTXOs don't live very long. So you can get really good um, proof size decreases if you keep your new UTXOs in the little trees. And a lot of times they're clustered together. So you, you'll have like this tree, little tree with like 16 leaves in it, 16 UTXOs, and the whole thing gets spent at once. And so you're like, oh great, I basically don't have any proofs, right? Because they're all proving that each other exists and you just hash them all to get to the root. Uh, so that's really nice. So yeah, so if you did it naively and you aggregated within a block, also um, proofs aggregate within a block in that if I'm proving, uh, like if I'm proving this element and this element, you don't have to give individual proofs up to the top. You just give a proof up to where it intersects. And then, you know what I mean? Like so, uh, I'll go, yeah, if, if I, I need to prove 0 and 6, uh, then the proofs of 1 and 5, and I don't have to like give either of 8 and 10 because that's computable. So things like that where you end up, you end up saving on there. But so if all you do is say, okay, I'm only going to do within, you know, hopefully UTXOs stay in the little trees when they're new, and I give within a single block aggregation. Um, no, sorry. If you don't do within single block aggregation, 600 gigs of extra proof data for IBD which is bad. If I do within block aggregation, 
Um, IBD is 7.5 billion hashes, 250 gigs. So 2x. Still not great. There's even cooler things you can do. So the fun thing is um, when you're doing IBD, initially downloading the history of the Bitcoin blockchain, the server you're talking to knows the future. Right? So you're like, hey, give me block 300. It's like, okay, here you go. The server you're talking to knows what happens in block 301, 302. It knows all the way up to today. Um, so it can give you hints. This is trusted, but you're just trusting them to help you go faster and use less memory. Right? You're, not, you're not trusting them for any security. So if they lie to you, you'll find out and be like, dude, why are you just making me download more? And you hang up on them. Um, but what they can do is they can tell you how, they can tell you that lifespan. Right? So they can say, hey, this output gets spent in the next block. Keep it in RAM. This output, still UTXO on my end. So I don't know when it gets spent. You can flush it, you know, get rid of it from your RAM. Um, so you can tell the little UTXO nodes what they should keep in memory and that they won't need proofs for uh, a few blocks later. So if you do this, you get this nice curve where this is how much memory the mini UTXO nodes dedicate to caching proofs. And this is how much data um, on the y-axis a initial block download will take. And it really should be like log scale, but it looks so much more impressive in linear scale. Uh, <laughs> and, and also it never gets to zero because this is just like runtime memory usage. So like it never went below like 70 megs of memory usage because there's all this other database stuff going on. Um, but if you only use I don't know, a couple hundred megs of RAM, you get way down. Uh, and this, this is sort of the look ahead. So the idea is uh, you tell the IBD server that's giving you data, um, tell like flag, just with a single bit, flag all UTX, all outputs that will be spent in less than 1,000 blocks after they're created. And I will remember those and don't give me proofs for them. So then it's really simple because there's no like back and forth, hey, what do you need to prove for? It's just, I'm going to give you everything, and I'll tell you what to remember, and I won't give you proofs for that later. Um, so if you look like a thousand blocks ahead, it only takes, I don't know, two, three hundred megabytes of RAM, and you get your total proof down to like 60, 70 gigabytes extra, which, you know, you're already downloading 250 gigs, an extra 60 or 70 gigs is, you know, something, but not a big deal, I think. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to have no proofs ever, then you need like 12 gigs of RAM. But why not just run a regular full node at that point? Um, and if you have no RAM at all to dedicate to this, then yeah, you're, you're basically doubling the download size for IBD. So, and this is, this is not super current. This is a couple months ago, I think. But I imagine the trend will continue. Um, OK, so this is last slide. I think I'm out of time. Uh, so the idea is this is not a consensus fork. Um, if people don't like it, no problem. I can just write this code. I mean, no, I want people to like it, and I want this to get into Bitcoin Core and, and so on. Um, but it's not a fork. Uh, it is a protocol level thing, somewhat like compact blocks, where you're going to need new network messages. You're going to need new state on the peer-to-peer -peer layer and stuff like that. It's a fairly intense change if you really want to change a core node and, and rip out level DB. Um, so it's a lot of work. I'm not saying this will totally be in like version 0.19. It'll take a while. Um, but we can start with a bridge node and archive nodes, which send block proofs and do all that stuff. And I think it's a cool way to uh, optimize this. So you could, the, the end result is you could run a full node and it's like, you know, a kilobyte or two. Um, the other thing you can possibly do is it can link into a lot of other things people are working on, like assume uh, UTXOs and uh, parallel validation. So since the entire state of the system is like one kilobyte now, you can sort of say, I have a server rack with 10 computers. I give each of these 10 computers a, you know, not quite trusted, but we're going to assume valid snapshot of the UTXO set because it's so tiny. And we just tell them, hey, download from block 100K to 200K and tell me what result you get for your UTXO set after. Um, and then you see at the end, do they all match up? And if they all matched up, you've, you've verified everything, you're done with IBD. Uh, but you can sort of split it arbitrarily among different computers and cores because the, the network message to transmit the entire UTXO set is like in one TCP packet now. So it's really cool. Um, there's lots of things. I, I need to keep working on it. Uh, everything takes longer than you think. But yeah, <laughs> uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, there's some people who have been making PRs, and there's like an IRC 
thing called UTXO, which sometimes people ask questions and I try to answer fairly quickly. Um, but if you're interested in it, come ask or look on GitHub or yeah, use it. it. There may be other use cases for it too. Okay, do I have time for questions or am I over time? Five minutes? Okay, so if there's any questions, we can do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, that one of the initial things with this, we're looking at sparse Merkle trees, and most of the optimization, they, they work, but they're fairly heavy in terms of data and, so it, and, and hashing. And it seemed like most of the things I was doing to optimize was making the tree less and less sparse. And so I was like, well, maybe I don't want sparse Merkle trees. Um, but I, Wait, so there's always sure sure yeah I, I so I looked at that it, it didn't it seemed like th that was a possible direction um, but I this was about a year ago and it seemed like uh, possible but seems like this will be more efficient but I haven't really compared them in depth okay yeah I mean I think there's similar research like plasma or, or a lot of Oh, I didn't talk about Ethereum because this is like scaling Bitcoin. But um, this it would solve all the problems in Ethereum because Ethereum's main problem is like disk I/O, where they've got a they've got this huge state database that they have to keep looking up in level DB. And if you had just proofs, it'd be great. But in Ethereum, you don't know what proof you're going to need because like your contract might call some other contract and it calls this. And like in an adversarial case, it can be like a lot of call stack stuff, and you'd need proofs for all that. And so it doesn't quite apply, but I think Ethereum people are looking for this kind of thing in like Plasma. Um, so yeah, there, there's definitely overlap there. Cool. Uh, 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 yeah. The, the future prediction stuff, can that be compressed somehow and then put in the source code? Like as in just hints saying, oh, maybe catch this, don't catch that. Uh, it's kind of big, right? It's, it ends up being hundreds of mega, like, so like, yeah, they're like, I, how bitmaps or how like how do you represent it if it's one bit per every txo ever there's something like 900 million or yeah 900 million ever so it's like kind of too big to put in uh but probably okay to send over the wire as you're doing ibd uh, but you could i don't know so so th there's different ways to do it there's different ways to encode it compress it things like that yeah i guess you could give up towards the end because it doesn't matter as much i i don't know like these are all sort of optimizations. You, you want the full thing. You could just have like a, a smaller sparse set where you say, hey, I'm going to encode all of the outputs that live less than 10 blocks. And that might be pretty small. You might be able to get that into a couple megs. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I haven't. There's so many cool things to explore and like set reconciliation and how to compress these things and how to send these things. And it, it gets complicated. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm, so right now I'm doing like fairly straight, simple way, and I'm like, up. Oh, I put little comments. I'm like, you can definitely do this better, but you know, just get it working for now. Yeah. So the cryptographic security is something that just hash, uh, hash, like could you do? Yeah. There's a sort of hand wavy part at the end of the paper. I'm pretty sure you can you can not rely on collision resistance and only rely on pre-image resistance. In which case, you can reduce the the output sizes of the hashes. But, but people are like, no, come on, don't do that. That's scary. Um, but I, 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 I might want to try to really make a good argument slash proof um, if I have a minute. The, what you do is you take the block hash of the, the block that confirms a, an output, and you sort of key the, the, ha the, so the leaf that goes into the Merkle tree also has the block hash in it. Um, and that's only you know 32 bytes, whatever, and you just add it to everything. And what that does is it makes it so collision attacks aren't really practical anymore because to collide, you want to put an actual, actual leaf in the tree and then have a fake leaf that, that matches that. And for normal, like either cycle finding or just general collisions, you sort of have two lists. So like, here's the fake one, here's the real one. If the real one is unknown before it's confirmed, you basically have to mine a block to find a, a real one to match against your fake ones. And it increases the difficulty of, of the collision attack enormously. Well, by like two to the, it ends up being like two to the 35, not two to the 70 or so, but still enough. And, and, and you can sort of make economic arguments that like, well, any attacker that could perform this attack on the U3XO accumulator wouldn't be a 51% attacker. It would be like a 99.99999% attacker. Like they need more hash power. You know, they need a, a, a billion times more hash power than the entire network has to do it. In which case, like, 
you're so screwed anyway. So, so like, this is why I'm like, oh, I can't. Also, it'd just be so much fun to like have only like 20-ish or 24 byte hashes because then all the numbers just, it, you don't have to change the code. You just like reduce all the proof sizes by, by that. Um, yeah, but it's, yeah. It's a nice constant. It's a nice, it's a nice like, hey, I just shaved 30% off everything. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but, but I, I, right now I'm just sticking with 32 bytes because that's safe even if you worry about collision attacks. Um, but yeah, then otherwise it's just the standard sort of so Merkle tree assumption. Also why you shouldn't use RSA, like not to introduce new assumptions. Oh yeah, this one's quantum, quantum secure or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good for quantum computers. I don't know. I mean, yeah, but mainly it's just that it, it hashes feel safer, right? Because it's just like SHA-2 or whatever. Yeah. Is yeah. anything you commit to that would like help this? Like, oh, so we commit didn't talk about commit. So you, you could commit to the actual UTXO, the, all, the whole roots at the top and put that in the Coinbase. But uh, I mean, then, then you've got like UTXO commitments. Um, this is, I'm not suggesting that. And because that's a different trust assumption. You could also commit to the proofs. Well, it's, I mean, it, there isn't, right? But then everyone's just going to start doing sort of SPV where they're like, why do I IBD? I'll just download. Get lazy if you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's that can you convince people to make a soft work change where, hey, now you've got to commit to this thing, which maybe someone will find a way better way to do this in a year or two. And now you've got it, this like old way soft worked in. Also, the main benefit is that it helps like sort of lazy SPV people. I don't know. So like, I'm not, I'm not You're pushing for so that. Good. Everyone's just going to stop doing full nodes. Uh, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating for any commitment. Another thing you could commit to is the proofs themselves. Uh, so sort of like how in SegWit you've got this like witness commitment to all the witnesses, you could have a little hash of all the proofs in, that are needed to, to verify this block. Um, and that helps. Peter Will was saying that helps with some denial of service attacks. I don't think it's necessary, but it, but it could uh, prevents certain types of DOS attacks, I think. What specific yeah. problem are you solving in Bitcoin Core right now? Um, yeah, size of chain state. So it grows unbounded. So eventually it gets too big, and, and that's bad. Probably it's fine for years. But long term, it's really nice to say, hey, we've got now a log n representation of chain state. Uh, in practice, what I think it'll do is it'll speed things up, especially of a spinning hard drive. Because uh, right now, if you have a spinning hard drive and you're doing IBD, your CPU is at like five, ten percent, and you're just waiting on the disk. It's not a consensus protocol change. It's it's like you you don't commit to anything, and you know you want it's it's more like compact blocks. It's a network level change. Um, but yeah, if, if that happens, then you can you know reduce the chain state size and all and potentially for older computers, it speeds it up a lot because they can keep everything in RAM. Yeah, so the RSA ones are, are, you can put in, you know, x1, x2, x3, or x3, x1, x2. Not so in the hash, well, yeah, in the hash one, you get a different proof if you put it in a different order, which is a downside. It would be really, because what you can't do with UTXO is say, hey, I've got my UTXO set on disk. It's not insertion ordered, it's like hash ordered on, in level DB, like just by hash. I can't build UTXO without knowing the order things happened in. Um, and so I'd have to, re if I want to build my UTXO root, I got to replay the whole thing. Like if I've got the blocks folder, I've got, and that's going to take, I don't know, an hour or something. So that's kind of slow. Uh, it would be cool if it was, it was accumulated. Uh, yeah. um, just to add up on the what would it help, if I understand correctly, it would kind of also allow you to uh, run a full on a phone, as long as you've seen all of the network at least once, right? Yeah. So for phone, okay, you like sync on your desktop at home, and then the entire chain state is like fits on a QR code, and you can copy it over your phone, and then keep it up to date there. Yeah, so it it's it helps with state size. You still have the CPU and the network, and it, in fact, it makes network traffic a little bit worse. So I don't know how practical. Hopefully, it will be more practical on a phone, but you're still going to like drain the battery and use a lot of network. So maybe when it's charging, you can do it. Yeah, Wi-Fi only or charging only. 
So, so I think it will be more practical, but I don't want to sell it as like, it'll totally work for everyone can run a full node on their phone. Like, eh, it gets better, but uh, there's, still, there's still limitations. OK, so thanks. And if there's more questions, let me know. Okay.